Bible there, if you could turn with me to the passage that Tony read for us, Psalm 95. And uh, this is a psalm that carries a surprise. A bit of a twist in the tail. Maybe even you could describe it as a sting in the tail. It begins as this call to worship. And I've, I've done this before at the start of services. I have read the first seven, almost seven verses... That amazing call to worship. And I've stopped there. But of course that's only half of this psalm. Because it suddenly ends with this solemn, even I would say severe warning. And in part I think that warning is so strong that the temptation is to stop at verse 7. It's almost quite jarring the way that it suddenly shifts. But hopefully as we look at this psalm today... We will see how and I think why the psalm is given to us like this. Why it all fits together. But first of all, this first section of the psalm, there's actually two calls to worship here. And they are saying slightly different things. Verses 1 to 5 invite God's people to join a celebration. Oh come let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Now I know that people who are not very good singers, this is often the verse or the idea that they turn to, that we can make a joyful noise to the Lord. And that is true, but actually what the psalm is talking about is something that is loud. This is not cliched singing round a campfire quietly. This is the volume turned up to 11. This is a call to loud, exuberant praise. To rejoice and give thanks to God, our salvation and security. So why celebrate? Well, because the Lord, that covenant name for God, is a great God and a great King above all gods. Human beings have always worshipped Many gods, generally things that we make in our own image. That was probably more obvious in the days that this psalm was written because these gods were named as gods. Today, we claim to be more advanced, more civilized, and so we don't need all these gods, and yet we still have them. Our culture is full of gods that people worship, we just call them by other names. The three classic things that people refer to as the gods that are worshipped being money, sex and power. But there are so many things, gods that people worship. But these other things that we worship, that we love and give ourselves to, they are self-evidently not worthy of that kind of devotion. Because there is only one God who would exist if humanity did not exist. There is only one true eternal king, the creator of all things. And having created all things, talks about in this psalm, the heights and depths, the land and sea, they're phrases that are designed to encompass the whole of the created order. Having created all things, he is the one in whose hand is all of creation. Everything is under his sovereignty. So rejoice. But then in verse 6 we're invited to a more obviously humble expression of worship. Get on our knees before God. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Why are we told to kneel? Well, because God is our maker. The one who created Formed, set apart, redeemed a people for himself. That, that word there, maker, it's not talking about creation in a general sense. It's not talking about how God created the whole of humanity. It is a very specific term about God creating a people for himself. How he created the people of his pasture 
and the sheep of his hand. Our maker is our shepherd. Caring for us perfectly. So come. Kneel before the Lord. Now instinctively. We might put these two things the other way round. God the almighty. Ruler of heaven and earth. The creator and the king. And the only true God. Brings us to our knees in humility. But then thinking of God as redeemer and shepherd. Might cause us to loudly rejoice. But the psalm puts it the way it does for a reason. It is right to rejoice. When we see that God is the only true God. The king of all the earth. Because we know that there is nothing in heaven or on earth greater than him. There is nothing more powerful than the mighty God. There is nothing that can overcome or outwit God. He is in control. We have nothing to fear, so we rejoice. And it's right to bow down before our Redeemer, our Shepherd. Because the almighty creator loves us with an everlasting love that we could never deserve, never earn, never be worthy of. He doesn't belong to us. We belong to him. And as his chosen people, he has made us his own. So we bow in reverence. The start of verse 7 Echoes a really important covenant phrase that is repeated throughout Scripture. (coughs) We are, He is our God, and we are His people. I mentioned Exodus 6 last week, the I will promises that are echoed in Psalm 91 that we were looking at. Just before the plagues, That would result in the exodus from Egypt. And the beginning of the journey to the promised land. God said this in Exodus 6. I will take you to be my people. And I will be your God. And that's one of those phrases. That crops up again and again throughout scripture. It's a really important phrase. The promises of the new covenant between God and his people looking forward to Jesus. Promises in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 36. They repeat that phrase. You shall be my people and I will be your God. And if you jump to the end of the Bible. Revelation 21. It reminds us that our home is not a physical place on this earth. But God himself. And it says behold the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. It's one of the great promises of scripture. He is our God and we are his people. And so we rejoice. There is one God, one king. We bow down because in his grace, his undeserved favor, He has made us his people. Let me go back to to one other place where that phrase is used. And it's in the book of Leviticus. Not many people's favourite Bible book. Because it is full of rules. Rules about sacrifices and festivals. Rules about food. Rules about how God's people are to relate to others. And in the the second last chapter, chapter 26, there is a promise of blessing for those who obey the laws. And it includes verse 12. I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. It's that same covenant phrase. But then, from verse 14, the rest of that chapter of Leviticus contains warnings of punishment. For disobedience to God's law. And it starts with this phrase. But if you will not listen to me. And will not do all these commandments. So we have here these two phrases. These two ideas. 
God has made for himself a people. But the call is to listen to him. God's people are those who listen. And this is exactly what is happening here in Psalm 95. Just to go back to the Advent candles and those two names for Jesus. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. The first part of this psalm speaks of, God, of, of the Mighty God. And we're now coming to him remembering that he is the Wonderful Counselor. The one to whom we must listen. Because here in Psalm 95 we have that humbling joy of being counted as one of God's people. Followed immediately with a warning to listen. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. That word today in verse 7 It doesn't mean just one specific day in history that the psalm happened to be written. Because what it means is that whenever we hear God's voice, it is today. Therefore, it is always time to listen. Whenever God speaks, today, do not harden your heart. That's that's what it's saying. It is always time to listen. So while there's a specific link to Israel's history in this psalm, and there is a fulfillment in Jesus, this call still stands. So let's, let's look at what it's saying here. As an example of those who do not listen, the psalmist looks back to the time immediately after the Exodus, when God's people had come through the Red Sea and were in the wilderness. They had heard God's promise. They not just heard it, they had seen his salvation in the most spectacular way. I think if God were to part the Firth of Tay and give us dry passage over to Tensmuir Beach, I think we would remember that, would we not? It would be quite the event. And yet... When we read what happens in Exodus, as soon as things didn't go the way the people wanted, as soon as things got just a little bit uncomfortable, they almost deliberately forgot what they had seen. They were unwilling to look back just the few weeks, even days, to when God brought them through the Red Sea. And they started to grumble and complain. And if I'm honest, I think we would do the same. We we might think, yeah, wow, if we saw that, we'd remember that forever. And, And yes, you would remember, but it wouldn't stop us grumbling, would it? We'd be in the same position. And and what happened in Exodus 17, they were complaining that they, they, they didn't have water. You might think, well, that's, that's a reasonable thing to ask for. But they didn't ask for water. They complained. They grumbled. They questioned the goodness of God and his salvation. And God brought them water from a rock. But the name of that place became Massa, testing. And Meribah, quarreling. It was a lasting reminder of their refusal to listen. And to trust in the Lord. And that incident in Exodus 17 was of course just one of many refusals to listen. Many refusals to trust in God. And ultimately the whole generation of adults who came out of Egypt. Barring two. Did not enter the promised land. That was the place of rest that God had promised. And because they didn't trust God, they didn't listen. They hardened their hearts despite everything they knew. Despite everything they had seen, they hardened their hearts. And they did not enter that place of rest. And so it's no surprise that 40 years later... As the people 
of whom very few were still alive that had been there at Massa and Meribah. They stood on the verge of Jordan, as the hymn says. They're standing on the banks of the Jordan River, preparing to finally enter Canaan. (coughs) And they are told again to listen. Before his death, Moses restated the law. That's what the book of Deuteronomy is about. It was written, given there, as they waited to cross the river. And at the heart of it, Deuteronomy 6, is a call that is still the centerpiece of the morning and evening prayers of Jewish worshippers. It's called the Shema Yisrael. That is the first words of verse 4 of Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. That is the theme of the book of Deuteronomy. A people who had proved their unwillingness to listen are told they are warned to listen. Before they cross the river into the promised land, God says to them through Moses, Hear, O Israel. But then, of course, if you know anything of the Old Testament, you'll know that actually they don't. And if you trace the history of the people, the same theme crops up again and again. The books of Kings and Chronicles, which chart the history of Israel and Judah, the two kingdoms, tell us regularly that the fault of the people and their rulers was a failure to listen. Much later, Jeremiah, he uses the word listen or listened 45 times in his prophecy. It's largely about listening to God and not to the false prophets who were telling them that everything was okay. Sadly, when God commissioned Ezekiel, another prophet, he warned him that the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you, for they are not willing to listen to me. Because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. It is the story of human existence. A failure to listen. Isaiah, another of the prophets, also contains a number of pleas from God to his people to listen. And all of them are within the second part of Isaiah. Which points us... Most directly to the Messiah, to Jesus, through whom God speaks. So let's take a moment to think about how Jesus is God's word to us. We see that in John's account of Jesus' life. That description of Jesus as the word of God, the living word. Then, of course, there was that amazing incident when Jesus was on the mountain with Peter, James and John and was transfigured before them. And God spoke directly to the three disciples and said, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. The same idea is picked up in Hebrews 1. We're told that God has spoken to us by his son. And we're told that since it is by Jesus that God speaks to reveal the only way of salvation, we're asked how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? In other words, listen to this message of salvation that comes through Jesus. To jump back into the Old Testament and back to Deuteronomy, in chapter 18, amongst all of those calls to listen... There is a reference to Jesus almost in the middle of that book. Acts 3 confirms that that's who the passage is truly about. And and Moses says to the people, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. He's looking forward to Jesus. To the one who would speak exactly as God commands. And the instruction that Moses gives that echoed right down into Acts chapter 3 And beyond, the instruction is clear. It is to him you shall listen. So come back to Psalm 95. This plea. Do not harden 
your hearts. Don't harden your hearts to the voice of God. That means, when we look at this in the whole scope of scripture, it means listen to what God says through Jesus. Hear him. Accept him. Submit to him. Listen to him and know as Jesus himself said in John 10. He is our good shepherd. And we need to hear and recognize and follow his voice. Listen to him and know as the disciples said and as we just sang. You have the words of eternal life. Listen to him and know that salvation is found in no one else. And of course, if coming to and listening to Jesus is the way in which we respond to this call in Psalm 95, then failing to listen to Jesus leaves us in the position that this psalm describes, unable to enter God's rest. So this is the call. Hear the voice of Jesus today, now, and listen to him today. Don't harden your heart against him. And yet Romans 1 tells us that not listening is the natural stance of every human being. We have enough evidence of God in creation to lead us to seek him. If we will listen to it. We have the inward evidence of our conscience. If we will listen to that. But we don't, do we? We often don't listen to these voices. And we don't listen to his word, the good news of Jesus. And so Romans tells us we are without excuse. Given over to sin. Condemned to a restless life. The great theologian of the early church, Augustine, said this. You made us for yourself, Lord. And our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. And yet we seek rest in so many other places, don't we? We try to find satisfaction, fulfillment in everything but God. Our culture tells us that we will find rest when we put ourselves first. When we listen to our own heart and be the authentic me. And yet the evidence all around us is that does not work. It is a lie. It's a false dream that can only lead to greater restlessness. Within the church we face the same problem. 2 Timothy 4, Paul warns, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And we see that all around us. Churches and and so-called Christian teachers who will lead people away from the truth and from listening to the voice of God by telling them what they want to hear. They might not even realize that that's why they're attracted to it. But it is. It's what they want to hear. The problem is that the more we listen to these lies, the more hardened we become to the truth. All this being said, it shouldn't surprise us that the book of Hebrews devotes almost two whole chapters to the warning of Psalm 95. It was bad enough that people wouldn't listen when God spoke through Moses. How much worse if we don't listen now that he has spoken to us through his own son. And that section of Hebrews ends with these verses. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest. So that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. Not listening, not trusting the word of God and the goodness of God. 
For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You see, outward religion is easy. That's why this psalm gives us such a sudden jarring shift from those who are coming to rejoice and bow down and suddenly saying, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Outward religion is easy. The temple In the days this psalm was written, the festivals, they would have been full of people who, if you were to stand on the edges and watch them, they would appear to be sincere and joyous in their worship, and yet their hearts were hard. They would not listen. Jesus saw these people in his own day. All of the outward signs of rejoicing In the Lord and in their maker and yet not listening. It was there in the early church. It has been there in every age since. All the outward signs of devotion. And yet not really listening to his voice. So the book of Hebrews says we will give account. We can't fool God with the appearance of listening. People might look at us from the outside and say, well, they don't swear, they don't gossip, they're not mean, they help old ladies cross the road, they go to church, they sing, they pray, they read their Bible. But that doesn't mean that we are listening. These are outward things. What matters is what's going on in our heart. Is it hard so that the word of God comes in and bounces off? Or is it a soft heart that receives, hears and listens to the word of God? And so in the middle of that section of Hebrews, all about Psalm 95, we read this. Take care, brothers and sisters, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We are told, listen to the voice of Jesus. And remind one another to listen to the voice of Jesus. Don't harden your heart against him. But let me finish with this. This psalm reminds us that the consequences of listening are worse than we can conceive. It might not sound a lot. They shall not enter my rest. But in an eternal sense, that is a condemnation to eternity separated from God and everything good. Everything that could bring us rest and peace. So the consequences of not listening are truly terrible. And we're meant to feel that as we read this. But remember that his voice is not harsh and overbearing. His voice is gentle and inviting. He is our shepherd and our maker. In our Bible studies we've been going through the book Gentle and Lowly. There are Two copies still available. If you want to take one, you can do. They're on the table. And there's also a couple of copies with the study guide. Just let me know if you'd like a study guide with them. But the title of that book, Gentle and Lowly, is taken from the one place where Jesus tells us about his own heart. Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Come to me, he says. Come to me, all who labour And are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. And learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. 
And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. My burden is light. The promise as Jesus invites us to come to him. Is a promise of rest. Rest in this life. In the sense of having peace with God. The freedom to live as God made us. To be who he has made us to be. It is a promise of a peace and freedom that can only be found in Jesus. That is not a guarantee of easy life and easy circumstances. But a promise that we can find rest. Even in the midst of the worst storms. But also only in Jesus there is this promise of rest in eternity. The true promised land. A rest with eternal peace with God. But if we don't listen to Jesus. If we harden our hearts to him. If we are his children. We will not know that rest and peace today. We may know it in eternity. But we will sense that battle. So today... Listen to him. Don't harden your hearts to him. And if we harden our hearts to him in an ultimate sense, if we reject him, then we will never enter that rest. So, yeah, let's come and rejoice. Rejoice that God is the only God and the king of all things. Let's come and bow down and worship our maker, our redeemer and shepherd. But let us also come and listen to his voice and enter his rest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. And Lord, within the solemn, stern warnings, we do hear that beautiful, inviting voice of Jesus. Saying, come to me and rest. Help us, Lord, to listen. Protect us, Lord, from hardening our hearts. Even today, as we go, Lord, let us not just put this word out of our minds. But continue to listen to you as you speak by your spirit. We have heard your voice today as we have read your word. Help us to listen. And let us find rest in him.